February 20th. For some of you, the date might ring a bell. Last month marked exactly six years since the announcement of the PlayStation 4, and I still remember it like it was yesterday. A small video released at midnight, the beginning of that month. We had heard about the rumors and speculated for a while now, so immediately grasping what it was that I was looking at, I sat there behind my monitor in pure excitement. Here we are, six years later, and slowly but surely, the final stage of PS4's life cycle is already approaching. Time has flown by. It has been a great generation so far, granted with ups and downs, but at the end of the day, I've played a large variety of amazing games. In this video, together with you, I want to celebrate these years by looking back at the 50 games that stuck with me the most. Keep in mind that this countdown is of course entirely personal. Rankings are not based on quality, but simply on my own enjoyment. Some of the highest rated or maybe your favorite games will be lacking, either because I haven't gotten to play them or I don't savor them as much as others. That being said, it took many hours of consideration, but ultimately I was able to settle on the result that truly matters, a list that satisfies me. I can only hope that it can simultaneously help you in discovering some amazing games you've yet to play. With that out of the way, sit back because it's going to be quite the ride. These are my top 50 games on the PlayStation 4. It is impossible to include a game that doesn't exist, so number 50 seemed fitting for a masterpiece that could have been. The PT demo is one of the most incredible horror experiences I've ever had. Announced in 2014 as a project from a mysterious new studio, players would discover as they reached the end that this was none other than a tease for Silent Hills, a reboot of the classic franchise directed by Hideo Kojima. The atmosphere in this playable teaser alone remains unmatched. Static noise coming out of the radio, the sound of rain splashing against the windows, the chilling presence of Lisa that's felt throughout as you loop through the same single hallway over and over. If you missed out on downloading the PT demo, you will sadly never be able to do so anymore, though maybe that's for the better. While it's a depressing thought that Silent Hills will never see the light of day, I'm only strengthened in my confidence for Kojima and his team to deliver something truly special very soon. Fortunately, a horror adventure that does remain available today is Until Dawn, a game which surprised even Sony by its unexpected success. Inspired heavily by the Quantic Dream formula of games, Until Dawn forces you to make many choices that affect how the story progresses. Presentation is top-notch, with great graphics, impressive motion capture and a few famous actors playing a role. I remember it was one of the first games that I played live in its entirety, I'd let the chat influence many of my choices, and the butterfly effect made it the perfect stream game as a result. Now, I wasn't the biggest fan of the sometimes cringe-worthy teenage drama that the game opens with, nor the plot twist leading into the conclusion that felt somewhat out of place. Other than that though, there are some really entertaining twists and turns. Until Dawn is the video game equivalent of a popcorn movie, that roller coaster ride you should at least have taken one time. Downhill is the only way to describe Electronic Arts' direction as of late. Studios were shut down, beloved franchises cancelled, and the sole focus on mainstream successes isn't doing the core gamer any favors. Thankfully, a few exciting indie projects have been able to provide one solitary, redeeming aspect to the company. Unravel doesn't do anything you haven't seen before in the platforming genre, but there's a certain charm to this game that makes it stand out. To see this endearing doll made out of yarn have to survive the brutal reality of a world for which it is simply too small. As a player you'll use that yarn to swing your way around, connect objects or even to form trampolines, the catch being that the yarn eventually runs out after traveling a long distance and therefore limits you in your movability. From the moment I saw developer Coldwood's director appear on E3 stage to announce his game with shaking hands and by stumbling on his words, I realized that Unravel was a passion project published by a company in dire need for more. 
The concept may be ancient, but the execution of Tetris Effect proves that it is timeless. Amidst a fall of 2018 filled with high profile releases, I found myself regularly booting up the game in between the more intense play sessions. Thanks to beautiful sceneries, colorful effects and music that reacts to your every move, Tetris Effect can range from both a form of stress relief to in fact an extremely stressful test of skills. VR compatibility is the cherry on top, though you'll be so focused on that small rectangular box in the middle that it'll be difficult to appreciate all the fireworks around you. My only gripe would be the steep price, because at 40 bucks I can fully see why conversation among gamers has yet to fully spread. If money is not an issue for you though, you'll find that Tetris Effect brings good old fun. And let's face it, what else from Tetris could you really want? South Park The Fractured Butthole, as the title clearly implicates, doesn't take itself seriously in the slightest. Think of it as an additional season of the TV show, made purely for the fans that you otherwise won't get to see. The humor is extremely meta, South Park is aware that it's a game and it'll let you know. Try skipping the opening cutscene and Cartman will thoroughly express his discontent, after which he stops you from playing further and rolls the final credits. Obviously I could spoil more of the jokes that made me laugh my ass off, but the effect wouldn't nearly be as strong. Expect lots of over the top scenarios, hilarious conversations and a ridiculous plot that struggles to make any sense. Gameplay wise, the turn based combat is relatively basic, you move around a small grid and can choose from a limited set of items and attacks to use, but therefore where the traditional JRPG fails to hold my interest, South Park's accessibility factor encouraged me to play through it twice. I obtained the Platinum Trophy and I had a blast. Never did I expect while playing the beta of Rocket League two months prior to launch that the game would blow up to become the phenomenon that it did. Don't get me wrong, I recognized its potential, but at the same time, I was also aware how its predecessor on PS3 had flown completely under the radar. Now that it'd be far from the case. Word spread quickly once Rocket League released for free on PS Plus, and millions of players across many platforms have been active since. The idea is easy to explain and simply boils down to playing football with cars. A 1v1 encounter is overseeable, a 4v4 match can be chaotic as hell. Best of all though is the learning curve. As you sink more time into it, you get a grip of different techniques that can turn out to be deciding factors in order to beat your opponents. Rocket League is easy to learn, hard to master. Infamous Second Son ended up to be my least favorite installment in the franchise, but that doesn't take away it was still a highly fun game to play. As one of the first exclusives available after PS4's launch, Second Son immediately showed off what the system could pull off from a technical point of view. Amazing particle effects, great lighting that created a sense of realism, the presentation still holds up well today. What I really liked was the sense of momentum that was always guaranteed, whether you used smoke to dash around, neon to run up on tall buildings, or the video powers to grow a set of wings. Unfortunately, it's Delson's story and the repetitive nature of all the side activities that make me look back at the overall package as a little underwhelming. Not because Infamous Second Son isn't a good game, but because the first two titles left a bigger impact. It's comprehensible, but a real shame that Evolution Studios was closed down following the release of Drive Club. Saying the game had a rocky start would be putting things mildly. Intended to be a launch title revealed at PS4's very announcement, Drive Club ended up being delayed by a full year. Massive server issues and sketchy promises about a free PS Plus version caused additional controversy and sure didn't do the game any favors. Nevertheless, Drive Club managed to do a total 180. After several content updates and expansion packs, as well as a dynamic weather patch, what remained many months later was a beautiful looking racing game full of content. Sadly, it was already too late. While I regret to say that Evolution Studios is no more, I applaud the dev team for never giving up. For a second I questioned if Advanced Warfare should have been the title to make it to this list, but in the end I figured that Modern Warfare Remastered is the Call of Duty game I consistently return to. 
Whether that says more about this entry or the quality of card games nowadays, I honestly think it's a bit of both. Modern Warfare was a revolutionary title that changed the first person shooter genre forever. The campaign is like a summer blockbuster, full of spectacle and with a gorgeous graphical upgrade. The multiplayer is exactly what you know and love and with the latest modes added to the mix, I still start up Modern Warfare for a few matches of gun game every now and then. Growing up with games long ago, I vividly remember the many times I'd stay up until midnight playing Super Mario until I couldn't keep my eyes open anymore. Platformers were synonymous with gaming in those days, they practically went hand in hand with each other. Man how the times have changed. With the rise of online and other game types, AAA publishers have essentially ignored the genre for quite a long time. Thankfully, Activision made a first step and sparked some hope that this may change one day, because with both Crash Bandicoot and in this case Spyro the Reignited trilogy, it has been proven that many people are still longing for these games to make a comeback. Spyro's focus on exploration and gathering collectibles made for the perfect activity during downtime or as a distraction while I would catch up on videos and podcast episodes. The graphics are gorgeous and there is no stress involved, it's just a highly fun and relaxing set of games to play. Playdeads Inside didn't hit the PS4 until a little after its initial release, hence I played it on the PC. For a game with such amazing critical reception and an explicit style, I knew it was going to be special and so I couldn't hold out. The game is ambiguous, it doesn't provide any context for the world you find yourself in, but evident is that something is very messed up. You play as a small boy, trying to survive in this brutal universe and as the player, discover the purpose for his quest. The audio design is unmatched, the puzzles are simple yet smart. Dominating the conversation was the plot twist at the end, a moment which surely also blew my mind. But while everyone praised Inside's last sequence, asking what its ending meant, a question even greater did linger on my mind. Was its purpose for me a shock value or was that truly a genius developer with vision behind this choice? I'm afraid I'll never find the answer. Is there a point to recommending a game that everyone already owns? GTA 5 has sold around 100 million copies, it cannot be understated how huge of an amount that is. Of course, this raises the question, are these numbers deserved? Well, if you'd ask me, to a certain extent, yes they are. There is no doubt Rockstar creates worlds that are so full of detail, no other developer can come close. Every character is well written and scenes like Michael confronting the yoga teacher flirting with his wife are so hilarious they are forever engraved in my mind. The missions are over the top and many people are still playing the online mode today. But GTA 5 is also a flawed game, highlighted by outdated controls and certain character motivations towards the end that don't make sense with the rest of the plot. All my other points are up to personal taste. I preferred the grittiness of Liberty City over the sunny San Andreas, the rawness of a character like Nico Bellic over Michael with his family issues, and the silly humor of Roman over the in-your-face approach that Trevor takes. Despite therefore not being my favorite in the series, GTA 5 is a great game, but again, you already know that anyway. I wasn't sure what I was in for upon playing Journey in 2012. I knew that game company as the creators of Flower, a casual escapade that despite inflicting some sort of shame to admit you played it, in fact took my breath away. Where most games are heavy on action and interaction, that's brought to an absolute minimum in Journey. The ambience is calming, you don't do much more than exploring and a bit of puzzle solving as you try to reach the top of the mountain. Then there's the unique approach it takes to co-op. On your way you have a chance to run into another player, the catch being that there is no voice chat, there are no commands to give, you don't even get to see a PSN name enabling communication via messages. Although you're not forced to work together at all, never had I gotten to develop a bond with someone I didn't get to actually know. Indifferently listening to gamers rave about the appeal of the Souls games, it took until Dark Souls 3 for me to realize myself what the hype was all about. As frustrating as it may be to die over and over, to travel large distances yet lose your progress within the snap of a finger, once you finally defeat a boss, there is no feeling quite like it. 
I think back to bosses like the Dancer of the Boreal Valley, where it took many attempts to figure out the attack patterns, but once I did, dodging its every move eventually put me in a trance-like state of mind. I streamed the entirety of Dark Souls 3 on Twitch. Sometimes the chat was there to support, more often to make fun of my mistakes. Either way, they only strengthened my motivation to make it to the very end. What Remains of Edith Finch completely slipped under the radar for me. Treating it like just another walking simulator, I was quick to dismiss it at first. But there it presented itself again, piquing my curiosity once I noticed all the awards it racked up. Well, I would quickly learn that the appraisal was justified. It didn't take much longer than a few hours to roll the credits, but the story that it told within that time frame is one I won't forget anytime soon. Edith travels back to her old house where she relives her memories and tells a story to you as the player. One by one you'll get to know each of her relatives through small separate sequences and some of these encounters are absolutely brilliant. They blend in new gameplay mechanics with the tales they tell and while I would love to reminisce about my favorites with you all, trust me, play it yourself and you'll thank me later for preserving you from these events. One of the most obscure games on the list is no doubt Oli Oli 2, a small indie title that some of you may have played because of PlayStation Plus. Contrary to the majority of players who were introduced to Oli Oli through the free offer, I had already been anticipating it, having played the original on my PS Vita. I love trial and error challenges, point systems and leaderboards that incentivize you to constantly one-up yourself. I love skateboarding games, although Oli Oli isn't quite comparable to the usual suspects in that genre. See, you don't merely use tricks to get the best score. Every single jump and grind requires a precision timed button press if you don't want to lose your combo and fall off your board. I was the fifth person in the world to obtain 100% completion, which really should say it all. Oli Oli 2 had me totally hooked. Where EA remains stubborn and has still not answered the desperate screams for a Skate 4, Steve provided a decent alternative for fans like myself in the meantime. I thoroughly enjoyed completing all its challenges in order to get every gold medal. Combining several sports like snowboarding, skiing, hang gliding and wingsuiting added a nice amount of variety that never made the game feel stale. Unlike the arcadiness of SSX, Steep goes the opposite direction with a more realistic, at times almost simulation-like approach. I found myself conflicted whether to appreciate this or be a bit disappointed with the lack of optional tricks to pull off, and the physics can also be a little dodgy. What I surely will credit Ubisoft for is the surprising amount of support that Steep received ever since launch. I don't expect a game like this to have sold millions of copies, but frequent content updates have ensured that I still play Steep occasionally up until this day. For now, Trials Fusion will close this section of dexterous challenges for high school hunters like myself. During my childhood I'd already played Trials on PC, so imagine my delight when I heard that a full-blown version was now finally coming to PlayStation. Controls may appear to be simple, requiring you to do little more than hit the gas, brake and steer through its 2D levels, but hidden behind the simple mechanics is a surprisingly difficult game, especially once you get to the final sets of levels. Early on Trials suffered from lots of lag in online matches and I despised the amount of content that it locked behind DLC and extra expansions. Nonetheless, seeing as PS4's first year wasn't exactly filled with releases, Trials Fusion managed to take up lots of my time. The sequel called Trials Rising literally just released and I cannot wait to dive in. And speaking of games that took up much time, I am obliged to give credit where credit is due. No doubt some of you will raise an eyebrow just hearing the word Destiny, because like many others, the expectations that were shaped initially killed the game for me pretty early on. At fault was Bungie, who never conveyed well what the core of the game would actually be. Was it going to be a first person shooter? Was it an RPG? Was it a story driven game? Well, it turned out Destiny wasn't exclusively one of those, but a little bit of each. The result is that it didn't excel in any particular area, and thus after completing the shallow campaign and trying its mediocre multiplayer, I put the game away within days. However, months later I would make a return, forced by some of my friends who had become addicted and I couldn't grasp why. 
Destiny then finally clicked with me, once I understood that desire to get better loot, to attain higher levels and to beat raids by cooperating with others. Granted, the sequel hasn't been able to hold my attention that same way, but I still look back at the original Destiny with fond memories. Guerrilla Games remains the single source of pride for gamers in the Netherlands like myself. Horizon Zero Dawn increased justification for that. Not to take anything away from the achievements of the Killzone series, but Horizon showed Guerrilla's ability to go a step beyond. A sprawling open world, gorgeous graphics, cool robot designs and most importantly addictive gameplay led to me obtaining my Platinum within a single week. Where Horizon falls short is in its story. Sure, the concept is interesting and the plot contains a few twists, but often having you stand still in a room to watch two holograms talk, I could think of more creative ways for it to be told. Furthermore, where I found Aloy to be remarkably bland, many publications have already deemed her to be the next PlayStation icon, and in this regard, I feel Horizon may have received a bit too much praise, even for my own liking. Nevertheless, a sequel is inevitable, so I can only hope it can account for its few shortcomings. I felt strangely exhausted by the time I reached the end of Detroit Become Human. Having been a fan of Quantic Dream for years, this confused me as the sheer scope of their latest game I can only admire. The number of choices that can lead to character deaths, totally new encounters and possible endings I have never seen in a game before. Combine that with a gripping story and three playable characters that are each relatable and interesting in their own way, and as a narrative experience there is little to critique about Detroit. Still, I felt conflicted, being unable to avoid a large sense of familiarity. From walking around, pressing buttons to make choices, analyzing crime scenes and taking part in quick time events, Detroit's limited gameplay for the first time made me realize Quantic Dream's talented team holds the potential to expand the boundaries imposed only by themselves. E3 demos built up massive hype, but contrary to everyone else, I never cared much for Watch Dogs prior to release. Cheap as it may be in hindsight to say I told you so, but I never believed this to be the next GTA. This was just another Ubisoft IP, borrowing the same ideas from all of its other games. Yet here I was, a few years, trailers and a delay to 2014 later, and upon launch I suddenly seemed to be the only one actually content with how Watch Dogs turned out. Hacking traffic lights to watch cars crash right in front of you, taking out your silenced pistol to clear off a base, or invading someone else's world online to play a hilarious game of hide and seek. Watch Dogs wasn't the most original game, nor of the highest quality, but I surely had a fantastic time with it. Before getting around to playing it, I held a bit of a grudge against Assassin's Creed 4. I loved the second game in the series, but franchise fatigue had subsequently settled in by the year after year release approach that Ubisoft chose. Therefore, I consciously decided not to pick up AC4 next to my new PlayStation until I became wary of the launch games and needed a single player adventure to dive into. Nearly six years later, I still get the classic shanties stuck in my head. Assassin's Creed 4 didn't change up the traditional formula in the slightest. It still looked like a PS3 game and frankly it still played like one. But Edward Kenway's likeable personality and the Caribbean setting stole the show. Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor was ultimately the hardest game for me to rank in this list, because while it was my game of the year back in 2014, I'm not quite sure if I'd have enjoyed it as much had it come out today. The Ubisoft open world formula has passed its expiration date, which is exactly the reason why the sequel, Shadow of War, I never even got to beat. Given this, it illustrates the difference quite well between the early years of the generation and the phase that we're in now. Shadow of Mordor's graphics showed off the potential of the PS4, combat was inspired by the Batman games and implemented just as well, especially that satisfying feeling after pulling off one of the brutal execution moves. Now critics would rave about the Nemesis system, why it was such a groundbreaking feature, but I personally never cared about that specific aspect the same way. I loved Shadow of Mordor because it was Lord of the Rings and it felt so great to play. 
How amazing is it that a tiny arcade game released day and date with PS4 is still among my favorite games on the system right now. I had barely heard of Resogun before I downloaded the game on the 29th of November as the first free title on PS Plus. Controls are fairly simple, you move either left or right and shoot at enemy targets coming your way. The concept may sound conventional, and it is, but the execution makes it great. The upgrades you acquire that make you feel more powerful, and the large bosses that explode into a huge amount of particles, covering your screen by the end of the level. The real accomplishment of Resogun is that even with two AAA games installed on my PS4 that first week, I'd consistently go back and play it in between. An iconic character in Spider-Man, a talented developer in Insomnia games, and a publisher in Sony which understands like no other what it takes to live up to the reputation of such a household name. Prior to Marvel Spider-Man's release, it was already clear that it possessed all the key ingredients needed to make for a fantastic game. Hype seemed through the roof, but having never been the biggest fan of the superhero genre myself, I didn't shy away from saying that I barely felt excitement for the game myself. Exactly for this reason, I ended up surprised by how engaged I was in Peter Parker's story, in the dynamics between him and the friends he's surrounded by. Combat wasn't original but surely satisfying, which also counts for the web-slinging. Traversing New York felt exactly like you'd wanted to, and increased in speed with every level. Easily my biggest gripe though came down to all the side content, which I could only describe as basic and repetitive, taken straight out of the Ubisoft template that, if I hadn't made it already clear, I've grown so tired of. Alas, it leaves a task for the sequel that is undoubtedly to come, and I'm looking forward to when that day arrives. The Order 1886 was a case of wrong time, wrong place. In the midst of games transitioning from products into services, whether with multiplayer modes, DLC plans, or simply by offering a large world asking you to invest hundreds of hours to finish all its content, the Order 1886's short campaign caused a small PR disaster. With the length of only 6 hours or so, and not a whole lot of gameplay options or additional features, it's hard to disagree that the disappointing reviews were undeserved. Ready at Dawn had a lot to be excited about. They built an insanely impressive engine from the ground up. They came up with a unique story premise revolving around King Arthur's Knights of the Round Table. But in all that excitement laying the foundation for a promising franchise, I fear that Ready at Dawn faced the harsh reality of time constraints, forgetting to add substance. Consequently, I'm left with questions. Is there a future for the Order or is there not? Will we ever see what happens to Sir Galahad? What I do know is that I stand confident in saying that I loved the Order 1886. I will always be an advocate for linear story-driven games and I firmly believe it deserves a sequel. The original Mirror's Edge is one of my favorite games of all time, so it pains my heart having to admit that Catalyst was not the return that I had so long been asking for. Blinded by the ecstatic thought of Mirror's Edge receiving a second chance, I didn't want to hesitate about its deviance from a linear to an open world approach, nor the reset of its storyline and characters. In the end, all these changes however turned out to be for the worse. Running at such fast pace, map familiarity sets in quickly, repetitive side missions ask you to traverse the same rooftops time and time again. Faith's rebooted storyline, as well as the dystopian world that she's a part of, lost that sense of intrigue, raising doubt regarding the motivation to even start from scratch. But then again, as a super fan, it's easy to nitpick and focus merely on the flaws. At the end of the day, this is still a good game. It contains some smart level design that enables you to discover cool secret pathways. I did have a lot of fun, and I genuinely believe that the critical reception was worse than actually deserved. Mirror's Edge's first-person parkour maintains to be a breath of fresh air and mechanically feels smoother than ever. While I still enjoyed every hour of Catalyst that I played, I have come to accept that this is likely where the road will end. Battlefield 4 was one of the two games I bought along with my new PlayStation 4. The entire first few years I considered it to be the title that truly showed what the console was capable of. 
Where the previous generation limited us to 24 players, the PS4 version finally brought along the immense scale of 64 player battles. Where the old hardware was showing its age with low resolutions and almost no anti-aliasing, the PS4 version provided some of the most stunning visuals for console players at that time. Last but certainly not least, Battlefield 4 took the forefront in the trend for multiplayer games to now also target 60 frames per second on console, a very welcome change. Due to its smaller player base, Battlefield 4 is not the entry to recommend anymore right now, but that big leap makes it the most distinct release in the series this generation. A Way Out had been on my radar the moment I saw it get announced, where for most others it was the boldness of Joseph Farr's stage performances that made the game jump out, I saw an indie project trying to achieve something few others would even dare to attempt. A Way Out promised an emotional, interactive experience, not easy to deliver for a small team with a tight budget available. At the heart is a story between two prisoners who team up to try and escape and whose bond will grow over time. By forcing you to participate in this narrative together with a friend, the effect mimics itself on both the screen and on your couch. The creative ways in which A Way Out makes you work together as well as puts you up against each other is a concept that just works. Now sure, merely judge its production values and the sometimes awkward voice acting and animations and there is no doubt it doesn't compare to the huge AAA games. However, A Way Out is a testament to the fact that creativity over sheer production budget will always prevail. The large number of remasters on PS4 gave me a great excuse to catch up on the games I missed out on last generation. However, the games I did play before yet also chose to revisit, I can count on one hand. For Heavy Rain, I gladly made an exception. Apart from the outdated facial animations and downright cringy dialogue at times, Heavy Rain is one of those games I can see myself returning to for decades to come. Ethan Moss loses one of his sons in a car accident, his marriage falls apart and the tragedy can't seem to come to an end when years later his other son is kidnapped by the origami killer. To save Sean, you as the player take on the role of four different protagonists who each have their part in trying to reach this goal. I'm a sucker for detectives as well as drama shows and this story is both at once. Nine years ago I rapidly cycled home in anticipation with a copy of Heavy Rain in my hand. I had finished the game by the end of the night. Heavy Rain continues to be that roller coaster ride today. Could The Last Guardian possibly live up to expectations after a decade of waiting? The sad answer is that yes, it could have done so indeed, if only the game weren't harmed by unnecessarily awful controls and camera issues. At the core of The Last Guardian is a beautiful story between Trico and the boy who wakes up next to him, not knowing how he arrived in the mythical place that surrounds him. Amazing is the word that comes up when I think back to every moment of The Last Guardian that stuck with me. Annoying is the only way I can describe most of the time I actually spend playing it. Fortunately, an absolutely incredible moving ending makes up for every minute of frustration that led up to it. The Last Guardian is a game you play to remember. Comparisons between Spider-Man and Batman Arkham Knight will be hard to avoid, but the latter was ultimately the more enjoyable package for me. I mainly base this on personal preference. First of all, there's the astonishing presentation. Gotham City is dark and gritty, rain pours down from the sky and gives every object in the world this glossy look. I really liked the variety in gameplay, from the famous combat system that Batman itself revolutionized, to the puzzles, Batmobile chases through the streets, and the tank missions, which granted did become redundant towards the end. But most of all, where Spider-Man failed in offering side content with substance, Batman's open world missions were more meaningful. They added story and brought along new locations to keep things interesting. While the insane amount of Riddler challenges never incentivized me to attain 100% completion, I finished everything else that Arkham Knight had to offer. It put a smile on my face for a duration even the Joker would be jealous of. 
I still remember the shocked look on my face as Chloe took off her mask at PSX 2016. What we all anticipated to be a single player DLC for Uncharted 4 became Uncharted The Lost Legacy, a standalone adventure with two unexpected main characters searching for the tusk of Ganesh in India. Although I knew not to expect anything on par with the last chapter for Nathan Drake, as a massive fan of the series I couldn't help but still feel super excited for their spin-off. Therefore, The Lost Legacy could have easily let me down, but it didn't. With some of the best puzzles, environments and one amazing last chapter to top it off, it proved to be a worthwhile addition besides an already classic collection of games. Last year, Lara Croft's new trilogy came to an end and forced me to draw the conclusion that it failed to reach the potential that was at one point inside. With the release of Shadow Behind Us, I recently returned to the reboot and found myself once again pleasantly surprised. The 2013 Tomb Raider is an action-packed campaign which clearly took inspiration from recent successful franchises. A mysterious island, a pacing that never lets up, and big playable set pieces, this combination of elements forms an exhilarating expedition, though you may have seen it somewhere before. Fortunately, satisfying bow and arrow combat and a dozen optional tombs help add its own twist to keep Tomb Raider from feeling too similar. The flow the animations are specific, they take a while to get used to, but feel part of its identity now. A paper-thin story and bland cast of characters were never improved upon, but everything Tomb Raider does do well, and sure it is as thrilling an adventure to play as it was back when it came out. Probably the last odd one out, Wipeout the Omega Collection is my favorite racer on the PS4. With developer Sony Liverpool closed down and a niche fanbase that never really took off, I've come to feel like an ambassador and spread the word on why it's just so good. Visually, the first thing that will strike you is obviously its futuristic Neo Tokyo art style, but that's far from all that it has going for it. I spent dozens of hours elite passing every challenge and playing my favorite mode Zone, in which the speed of your ship increases with time, while the map receives an entirely different color palette as you try to survive. By combining the campaigns of three games, and of course including multiplayer to play online, Wipeout the Omega Collection contains a ton of content and will keep you occupied for a long time. I would be lying to myself ranking Red Dead Redemption 2 any higher than I did. Outside pressure may be enormous to do so, but the more time passes, the more I've come to realize its impact on me wasn't as large as I had hoped. On one hand, I could not be happier with the story it presented. I had waited for the sequel to one of my favorite games of last generation for 8 years, and it truly felt like an ode to the original in every single way. Arthur Morgan may be my favorite new protagonist in years, and the personalities of Dutch Vanderlind and John Marston remained fantastic. Watching the events unfold and carefully connect with the story that I knew put me on the edge of my seat, and the sheer scope of this world I had never seen in a game before. However, for such a beautifully crafted world and carefully set up narrative, I was also incredibly disappointed by the repetitive nature of each mission and even more so by the outdated shooting mechanics that haven't seen change in Rockstar's games for over a decade. The clunkiness of its gunplay translated to the multiplayer, which I felt inclined to put down within days as it simply made for an online experience inferior to just about any modern game out there. These flaws I cannot understate, as much as my mind would like me to. Nevertheless, Red Dead Redemption 2 left me satisfied, delivering the missing piece to a puzzle that had been incomplete for far too long. The power of God of War 3 is that even though you can practically tell its age, the game still holds up due to its phenomenal structure. Not a single second feels dragged out, at no point does it ever slow down. Combat is ferocious, its scale is enormous. Watching the colossal titan Kronos hold Kratos between the tips of his fingers had me struck with awe. 
Now, as a character, Kratos may be one-dimensional, and the story in the last game of the trilogy seems to be there to serve the epic encounters rather than the other way around, but hey, who's to say a future game couldn't improve on this? As someone who wasn't as attracted by brutal violence and gore 9 years ago, I missed out on God of War 3 until the remastered version hit the PS4 in 2015. From the beginning to the very end, God of War 3 entertained and convinced me to go back and play all 5 other installments. Sealing off the previous generation, The Last of Us summed up everything I already loved about Sony's new strategy on their first party side. An emphasis on single player, on storytelling, on deep character development, without forgetting the need for a mechanically sound and polished experience. By including the Left Behind DLC and playing in 60 frames per second, the remaster on PS4 is the definitive version if you somehow missed out. Often overlooked is the multiplayer mode. It stuck to its core, wasn't riddled with over powered abilities, though I'd argue the later edition of pay to unlock weapons ruined that fact a bit. I have replayed The Last of Us several times on both consoles since picking it up in 2013 and put over a hundred hours in factions online. However, I also have to be honest in saying that over time, The Last of Us has become a bit of a double-edged sword. For as many times as I replayed it, for as great of a game as I think it is, it never hit home for me the same way it did for others. The almost godlike status awarded to it by fans created a disconnect to a degree that wouldn't be fair to deny. Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice was the surprise of 2017. I had heard about it, I had seen the trailers, but I couldn't have predicted to love the game as much as I did. That Hellblade is a unique experience becomes clear from the first second. The main character Senua suffers from psychosis, a given detail that isn't simply conveyed through storytelling, but that you get to experience in an interactive way. By playing the game with headphones on, you'll hear voices left and right, back and forth speaking to you directly. You're placed in the shoes of a character in a way I've never seen before, and on top of the already fantastic sound design, it gives the game a truly airy vibe at times. I found that I needed a break after every hour of playing Hellblade, not because I didn't want to continue, but because it was mentally straining on me. Now gameplay is on the basic side. I quickly became aware of the patterns in which I'd switch between an exploration sequence to a puzzle section and a combat encounter. That combat itself also lacks depth with a limited list of moves and no further upgrades as you make your way through. But in the end, it's the feeling of isolation Hellblade induces, the way it makes you relate to Senua's character, that makes her journey unforgettable. Not often do you get to say thank god for Activision, but in this case it's justified. What they've done with Crash Bandicoot as well as Spyro, which I already discussed earlier, I can only commend them for. The Insane Trilogy brought back three classics from the PS1 days, but gave them a graphical upgrade to the standards of today. Within just about a week, the Platinum Trophies for all three games were in my possession. Ultimately, I found the first game to be my favorite, as I wasn't too fond of the gimmicky levels becoming of larger presence as the games went on, but that doesn't take away I had a blast smashing every single box and acquiring the speedrun relics in each level. Most importantly is that it answered my call for a revival of the platforming genre, and it seems I wasn't the only one asking. Record sales and re-inspired fan support led to Crash Team Racing Remastered confirmed for this year. Now I can only say fingers crossed for what the future for both Crash Bandicoot and platformers in general may hold. With sweaty hands and by slowly turning around each corner, I finally got around to beating Resident Evil 7 last year, because as much as I don't like admitting it, horror games scare the shit out of me. I touched on it briefly when I talked about The Last Guardian, but Resident Evil 7 is comparable in that it's a game I'd rather remember than actually revisit, though for very different reasons. I was intrigued by the story, I wanted to find out what had happened to the Baker family and whether I'd be able to escape the house. The obstacles in your path to find these answers, however, were not easy for me to overcome. My viewers had a hilarious time as they watched me stream the entire game. Me myself, I nervously anticipated the next jump scare, the next stressful chase, or the next time grandma would randomly show up, only for me to wonder if this was finally the moment she'd jump in my face. Resident Evil 7 is a game I reminisce about fondly. I wish I could say the same about my time actually playing it. 
where most of the iconic duos from the PS2 era have left the stage, it's great to see Ratchet and Clank still alive and kicking. The remake slash reboot of the original game on PS4 certainly doesn't reinvent the wheel, but it's still such a fun game to play. I've heard complaints from many purists who didn't like the changes made within the story, which I can respect. Having never played the original myself though, you'll understand that I personally wasn't bothered by this fact. To me, Ratchet and Clank brought back old school shut em up and platforming gameplay. There's a large range of the most ridiculous weapons from the pixelizer to the sheepinator or the traditional rhino rocket launcher. Gadgets like the jetpack or the rail boots and mini games like hoverboard racing add a great amount of variety. Last of all, the visual spectacle, brought by every exploding crate sending hundreds of bolts flying across the screen, is the icing on the cake. There are games you like and there are games that you appreciate. Naturally, making that separation tends to happen fast, but not with Bloodborne. Bloodborne I had to learn to appreciate. I had heard the stories about the infamous difficulty of From Software's games. The solutions, whether to farm and repeatedly backtrack, or to accept death and find your way back, never sparked my interest in these games before. Initially, Bloodborne therefore failed to keep me engaged. I died tens of times before defeating the Cleric Beast, and about midway through, I put the game down because I just couldn't be bothered anymore. One year later, thanks to my girlfriend, who in the meantime had become enthralled by Bloodborne's mysterious setting and deep lore, she pretty much forced me to finish what I once started, and together in co-op, we played through the rest of the game. By the time another year had passed, the Platinum Trophy was in my possession, and I had completed the entire game and its DLC more than a few times. Bloodborne symbolizes a personal story of resurgence, and is a game that I will now forever hold dearly in my heart. In 2014, with the Phantom Pain in sight, I dusted off my Vita and PS3 to play every single Metal Gear Solid entry, until I eventually caught up. Because its story was deemed to be so convoluted, I had never jumped on board. It was a choice that left me with no regrets. While the gameplay had come to feel outdated, the story totally held up. It shaped high expectations for Metal Gear Solid 5, but in fact, the game did not deliver what I thought. Despite a brilliant opening reinforcing my assumptions, Metal Gear Solid 5 let me down with a flimsy plot. However, in contrast to every game that came before, it delivered one of the best gameplay experiences ever. One that has genuinely ruined other games for me since, through incredibly solid mechanics at a silky smooth performance. With the Fox engine, Konami possesses some of the best technology in the gaming scene today. All the more tragic was it to see the more recent events unfold. I can't let that thought spoil the fun. Fulton extracting enemies to build up your army while classic 80s music blasts through the iDroid just never got stale. Over five years long, I've been beating the drum for Rayman Legends, and with still no word of a sequel, I don't plan to stop anytime soon. I've told the story by now, but growing up with games like Super Mario World on the SNES, Rayman Legends is the 2D platformer that can match itself, yet I never thought I'd find. Not only does it stand out with the most beautiful art style and unique physics that take time to master, the music levels steal the show. They use popular songs and play in sync with every jump or punch you hand out. It is a game filled with content, not only through its own collection of levels and online challenges, but also by including many of the best levels from the previous game. The fact I was asked to spend 40 euros at launch almost gives me a sense of guilt, because Rayman Legends is a game that deserved my money more than virtually anything else. Where do you rank a remastered collection of old games from your most treasured franchise? One that even includes your favorite game of all time. Uncharted The Nathan Drake Collection combines the first three games of an adventure that has turned into a legend for me. Unlike many games among this list, the Nathan Drake Collection is not exemplary of PS4's capabilities. Its graphics and gunplay, while still passable, have been surpassed. Despite all that, the impact it made on my life is everlasting. I will always love Drake's fortune for introducing me to Nathan Drake, to Sully and Elena, for its sense of mystery and great plot. 
Among Thieves turned the tide for the PlayStation 3 and improved practically everywhere it could. Monumental playable set pieces, a variety of stunning environments interwoven in a journey that naturally moves along but at rapid pace. Although I've always looked at Drake's Deception as the low point of the franchise, I continue to appreciate it, for adding depth to Nathan Drake's backstory and offering the most technically impressive sequences. With all the time I spent playing Uncharted on the PlayStation 3, and even with the disappointing absence of the multiplayer mode, the Nathan Drake Collection still managed to be number 2 on my list of most played PS4 games. Uncharted for me is simply eternal. God of War on PlayStation 4 didn't just revitalize a series in fast decline, it put Sony Santa Monica back on the map as one of the finest developers in the business. Learning lessons from the best storytellers in the medium, God of War granted Kratos a fresh start. A new Norse setting, a change in perspective that brought along a different style of combat, and a personal story between Kratos and his son Atreus that felt self-contained while laying the foundation for something greater that I cannot wait to see emerge. My sole piece of criticism would be a lack of boss fights, which I can only assume a sequel will make right. That complaint, however, does not hold up to the moments of pure joy, whether from viciously butchering a couple of Drogos or from scenes in the story that got me close to teary-eyed. When God of War was first revealed at E3, I immediately felt I was witnessing something remarkable. Still, with so many changes, I told myself to stay skeptical. Two months early, at a special event, I got to play through its first few hours. My mind was made up. I didn't need to wait any longer to know that all along, my gut feeling had been right. Shadow of the Colossus is a piece of art. It's one of the simplest games in essence. On his horse, Wanda enters a forbidden land, accompanied by the lifeless body of a girl he would do anything for to be revived. Dorman, a spirit locked up in the tower of the map, tasks him with defeating 16 colossi and in return will grant him his deepest wish. You're let loose to explore the world at your own pace, a world that invokes all kinds of emotions. At times I felt a wonderful sense of peacefulness, but there were also moments of anxiety, awareness of your lonely presence in this vast empty space. In complete contrast are the battles with every colossus. They feel epic and star an iconic, bombastic musical score that's been stuck in my head ever since. But the greatest achievement here Bluepoint Games is responsible for, having proven that Shadow of the Colossus is a timeless experience. Without touching any port core to the original title, and by plainly upgrading sound and visuals to the standards of today, I never once perceived to be playing a game nearly 15 years old. After the last 49 games, it's safe to say this generation has been a great one so far. We've not quite reached the end yet, and with a few more highly promising titles around the corner, who knows what the future will still bring. But set in stone was always that one game. It won't come as a surprise that if one game were to define this generation for me, that game could only be Uncharted 4 at Thief's End. Years I had waited for this one moment. A decade ago, I returned from a school trip to France with a copy of Uncharted Drake's Fortune in my hand. Now, a sinking realization made me aware that my favorite series was coming to an end. It was the closing chapter for Nathan Drake, the franchise had come full circle, and with Uncharted as the source of inspiration for this very YouTube channel, I got to share my excitement with all of you through many years of coverage. Uncharted 4 induced a magnitude of nostalgia, the likes of which I had never seen before. Every moment had a sense of weight behind it, because I knew this would be the last time I'd get to be around these characters. Looking at old artifacts in Drake's attic, playing Crash Bandicoot on the couch with Elena, and hearing Sully crack one last joke. Uncharted 4 is by far the most special experience I've ever had in 24 years of playing games, and allowed me to say goodbye to my most beloved characters in the best possible way.